Okay, hi guys. Uh, we have Ryan Salam and Kevin Carey here. Ryan, you want to get us started? Hi, um, we're here with Kevin Carey of Education Center, one of the most important uh, little think tanks in Washington, D.C. that's devoted to education policy. And more narrowly, uh, they've been focusing a lot on higher education policy. Uh, Kevin is one of my favorite writers on these subjects, and he's also done a lot of thinking about cost growth in higher education. Uh, how to make higher education more accessible to more people, but also how to see to it that the productivity of the higher education sector uh, is high and gets higher over time. Kevin, recently President Obama taught higher education cost growth in his State of the Union in a way that was very interesting and represented a break with how he's talked about higher education in the past. Uh, in the past, as you said, he's really been focused on attacking the making of profits in higher education, whether it's through private student loans or through the for-profit higher education sector that's been really mushrooming. But this was something entirely different. So why don't we start there? Can you tell us a bit about the shift in the president's priorities and what it might mean? Sure. You know, I mean, as you said, I think the first three years of the Obama administration's higher education policy have been uh, devoted primarily to going after uh, people who make money. Uh, first, they took on the uh, private banks that were involved in the student loan, the federal student loan system, and basically cut them out of the system and moved the entire uh, subsidized loan system over to the federal direct loan system. And then the year after that, they imposed a, a new uh, a set of regulations on, on for-profit colleges and universities. It was very controversial. It was the subject of a classic sort of Washington, D.C. lobbying war where um, all the lobbyists got rich, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, but in the end they did sort of follow through with a new set of regulations that was designed to basically cut for-profit colleges that they thought were not providing value to students out of the market. Uh, the administration has, has, until very recently, said very little about traditional public and uh, private nonprofit colleges which educate roughly 90% of all the American, of the, uh, American college students. And this is okay. a political constituency for the left, too, wouldn't you say? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a, a sort of definitely, I think, an ideological affinity between the traditional uh, higher education sector and the left, um, probably a voting constituency. And uh, the administration's efforts there have basically been focused on making sure that uh, enough money went into the Pell Grant program, which is the primary way that the federal government helps low-income students go to college, um, a program that has seen a huge increase in funding over the last three years, both because um, Congress wanted to serve more students and because a lot more students are low-income due to the recession. But Kevin, so, Kevin yeah. as, as you've pointed out, um, you know, in effect, the government has created this inelastic supply in higher education, you know, through accrediting you know, only certain schools, and then they're increasing demand, and now they're surprised that when you increase demand with inelastic supply, you get price increases. They're shocked, shocked to see price increases. Um, what, are they, do they see that, that what they really need to do at some point is increase the supply? in the dialogue around this issue is that there has been an increase in the supply of new entrants to the market. It's just all come from the for-profit sector, it, specifically for-profit enterprises that design their business operations to work inside the system and maximize revenue from federal loans and federal aid. So really not, I would argue, not competing on price. These, I mean, if they had been competing on price, perhaps prices wouldn't have increased, but most of them were, um, uh, uh, most of them were charging actually quite a lot of money, more than you would pay to go to a public college or university. Um, a lot of it was debt financed. I mean, these are colleges that get 90% of their money from federal sources, and only because they're not allowed to get any more than 90% of their money. There's actually a regulation around that. Um, so, you know, what I, what I think we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago in the State of the Union in, in a subsequent policy address that the president made at the University of Michigan, that there was some very stark language uh, of their, in, in both speeches where the president talked about, you know, how you can't just keep jacking up tuition and, and we can't just keep pouring more money into the system um, forever. We'll run out of money. And so I think that was a recognition. I think that was him saying in his words, or what you were saying, in 
more of economist terms. But um, what's what are the prospects for innovation in the sector? I'm excited because we've seen all these all this stuff in the news. We've seen Khan Academy, which is obviously not uh, higher education. We've seen MITx. Um, I've just heard about Western Governors University. Uh, we saw Udacity, and then somebody told me about Apple iTunes U. So all these potential innovations are any of these. Um, What's the potential for some real disruptive innovation? Maybe you can define disruptive innovation in higher sure. high education. So I think um, the things that you mentioned have some different characteristics. So I'll take Western Governors University to start. Western Governors is, is distinct in that it is a nonprofit university that acts a lot like most of the for-profits do in the sense that it has a national student market. It is entirely online. Uh, it's growing very quickly on purpose. How long has it been um, around? Uh, it, it was actually founded in the 1990s uh, by a group of 19 Western governors, that's the name. Um, but it took a long time to sort of ramp up and get to a point of real inflection on enrollment growth. Because of the regulatory barriers that you talked about before, they had to get accredited in order to be seen as legitimate and to be able to allow their students to pay for their services with the federal financial aid dollars. And the accreditation system, which is run by existing colleges and universities, um, is quite frankly very hostile to new business models. Um, and so it took them a long time to become accredited. The problem with accreditation is you can't get accredited unless you have students, and it's hard to get students to enroll at a non-accredited university. <laughs> The for-profits were clever enough to take a different route. What they did was buy up bankrupt accredited colleges and then build huge online institutions on top of them. So, At one point, the, go the going rate for an accreditation medallion seemed to be about $10 million. Wow. So, so, so how did Western governors get over the hurdle? They just kind of worked away. I mean, they, they did it the old-fashioned way. They, they worked away at it over many, many years, had a lot of meetings, filled out a lot of forms. Spent a lot of money, hired lawyers. And how is, how is their, their model different from a traditional education model? Well, it, so first of all, they have what they call a competency-based model of higher education, which means that your credential is not based on how long you were taught, which I would argue is the way most colleges uh, uh, give out degrees. You have a four-year degree, a two-year degree. We have a, based on credit hours. We have basically a time-based system of counting how much you've learned. Um, and Western governors, they have defined competencies in the major areas in which they teach. And when you meet them, then you have a credential. And if it takes you a long time, it takes you a long time. If it takes you a short time, it takes you a short time. In, in general, people get there faster. It doesn't take you But it, it's a lot of on. Just a second. It, it's a lot of it's online, though, right? It's all online. And then yeah. and the, and the role of a professor is very different. and advisors who help people make choices about which courses to take and, and uh, these are the, the target market for Western governors is working adults um, and so these are people who, who sometimes struggle to maintain academic momentum toward a degree as they manage the rest of their lives um, and so they, they have advised they, they found out that often was the, an advisor who could help people work through those issues was the best use of their money. And how is their how is their progress assessed? I mean, if, if you don't have a professor grading, I mean, what what goes well, they on? They have tests. I mean, they have assessments. They're just they are just. And, and Western Governors does go through the process of grading those assessments, but it's all standardized as it is in most for-profit colleges. Okay, and can we just go through some of the other uh, potential disruptive innovations? Sure. What is so what is what is the MIT? Thing about Western Governors, I should say, is they are much less expensive. Uh, for a course, and that's a lot less money than you pay. Um, uh, so the other things you mentioned, MITx, and uh, so six thousand dollars is the standard, and Western Governors is below that, or six thousand is no, Western. They charge six thousand dollars per semester. I think I would want to check. With you, okay. I think that's right. Okay. Um, so you had asked about MITx. Yeah. That was announced by MIT uh, just last month. MIT was really a pioneer in what's called the open education movement, um, open educational resources. 
about 10 years ago, they basically decided to take all of the uh, lecture videos, course syllabi, and other materials that they had already created for the courses they teach in Cambridge, and just put them online for people to look at. Yeah, but, uh, but, but as somebody pointed out to me, that that's just, you know, what, well, how is that different from a book? Well, no, and, and what's been interesting about um, MIT OpenCourseWare is, according to MIT, they've had 100 million unique users access it worldwide, even though arguably it's not all that different from a book. And I think that's because people are attracted to the MIT brand name and, and sort of what it connotes as to the choice, the curricular choices they've made. MITx, by contrast, um, is an initiative that's going to be designed to actually build real, authentic online courses and all that goes along with that from the ground up. There's been a tremendous amount of activity and development over the last decade since the first open courses were put together um, around the design and implementation of online learning. It's a much more sophisticated learning environment for students now than it used to be. Um, they're much better at helping students connect with other students, with um, assessing students, with um, making sure that the, the person who's taking the test is actually the person they are who they say they are. You can use face uh, recognition software and all kinds of things like that. So, so basically, they, I think, are now going to jump to the current state of the art and build courses that way. The other crucial thing about MITx, and in some ways this is just as important as the rest of it, is that they are going to offer credentials. MIT is going to give you a certificate that says uh, you took this class and this is the grade that you got, and that it's going to be free. Okay, Ryan, do you have a you want to step in? Uh, so, Kevin, one idea that you introduced recently is this idea of attacking the accreditation cartels at the state level by having the federal government play a role by accrediting uh, new kinds of uh, instructional providers. Can you tell us a bit about that, how this might work, and also about your thoughts regarding uh, how to regulate prices in this domain? Sure. So, um, again, the, the way the system works now, uh, if, if you have federal financial aid money, you can only spend it at an accredited college or university. The accreditation system is run by voluntary nonprofit organizations that are funded by existing colleges and universities. So to quote uh, Senator Todd Harkin from, a, from a, a recent congressional hearing, it's kind of a fox in the hen house situation. Um, existing incumbent colleges don't, I think, have a lot of incentives to let uh, disruptive innovators inside the system. So, and I, and I think it will be very hard to change that. I mean, their, their incentives are clear. Um, so my proposal was to allow um, innovative, high-quality, low-price uh, organizations, nonprofit or for-profit, an opportunity to be paid with federal dollars in exchange for transparency um, about their outcomes and some, some regulation on quality in terms of how much students learn. Uh, which is frankly uh, conditions that traditional colleges are not subject to today. Now tell me about the pricing regulations, because that seems like, a, on the one hand, a very important way to do this. So one way to think about it is that, well, it's fair enough to have price regulation in this space, because we're talking only about whether or not you're eligible for receiving public funds. On the other hand, uh, you know, it is, of course, a trial and error process to determine, well, how much is this likely to cost over time? So tell me about how you think about that. And the other thing is, how do you protect that institution, this sandbox for educational innovation, from itself becoming cartelized, because of course there are federal regulatory bodies that can, you know, get this accretion of, uh, of yeah. new interest groups, etc., as well as state bodies. You know, that's a good question. Um, price regulation is tricky. I mean, and, and one of the things we're running into as a nation now is that for a long time, the vast majority of public support for higher education came from state governments, which in fact did regulate prices. And many still do. I mean, I mean, some colleges and universities, public institutions, have discretion to raise prices, but in other states, they don't. The law says you will charge this much, or it's some kind of negotiation with a board of regents or with the legislature on an ongoing basis. Um, what's happened is the states have been disinvesting in higher education. They, they, I mean, we are spend, spending less state money per student now than we were before. You see states like California that are just cutting higher education budgets. In exchange for that, um, states have been letting colleges, giving colleges more discretion to raise prices, which is one of the reasons that we've seen big spikes in prices um, in, in recent years. I, I think on a long-term basis, we have both a cyclical and a structural problem with higher education prices. The cyclical me mechanism is the way 
Missouri state governments cut higher education budgets in down times. In, in fairness, this disinvestment partly is going hand in hand with the fact that you have seen so little in the way of productivity improvements. Uh, and so it seems like we're getting the worst of both worlds. You're both saying, well, you can charge whatever you like. At the same time, you know, these institutions seem to have very weak incentives to actually uh, improve productivity, uh, partly, I guess, because as Arnold had invoked earlier on, uh, because of the limited supply of these institutions, it seems like the higher education institutions have a lot of pricing power. Uh, is that a fair characterization? Well, I mean, yes, in the sense that, that public support for, almost all public support on a dollar basis for higher education is enrollment driven. You basically, if a student shows up, you get money from the government. Maybe it comes from their Pell Grant, maybe it comes directly from a state appropriation that is in turn based on enrollment, but it, it's not outcomes driven, um, it, it is not sensitive to productivity or frankly quality, I would argue which is one of the reasons we have a lot of mediocre or worse uh, public uh, uh, higher education institutions in this company, and, and I think probably private ones too, which are also enrollment driven and not, I mean, I don't know that that market's working that much better either because we don't have very much information about, about who's actually doing a good job teaching students. Um, so so the, the, the point I was going to make, I think, is that also um, as federal support has declined, I mean, as state support has declined, federal support has grown. Again, Pell Grants have gone from a $15 billion program to a $40 billion program in the last three years. Federal student loans, $100 billion a year now. Subsidized federal loans are really the, the uh, uh, escape valve of the entire American higher education system. It's where money comes from when it doesn't come from anywhere else. But the federal government has no regulatory pricing authority at all. I mean, it has never done anything to tell colleges not to raise their prices. And so, so there's an imbalance between where the public money is coming from and the public's ability to discipline. Oh, it's kind, it's kind of like Medicaid. That's fascinating. There's almost a pure misalignment of incentives where the states start kind of pulling back resources. The federal government almost automatically has to uh, has to put more in, and that just kind of and nothing is done to restrain the the, the kind of prices. Right. I think, I think that's correct. So, so then, oh, sorry. Okay. Please. Uh, well, back back to the topic of, um, of disruptive innovation. You you you've, yeah. you've used the Clay Christensen model. You want to just describe sure. that a little bit? Sure. So the, the Clay Christensen disruptive innovation model holds that there's a consistent pattern across different industries in which um, incumbent, long established incumbent businesses are disrupted by uh, you know up and coming innovators who enter the market by um, basically. Uh, providing services to non-consumption. In other words, they go after people who aren't buying anything right now and they offer them inferior products to start with. So he talks about the steel industry, he talks about the automotive industry, semiconductors, and so on and so forth. And, and the key part of it is that in the, in the initial years, um, the incumbents don't really, aren't threatened because they have the best customers with the most money and they're selling the best, highest margin products. And so they let it happen. But gradually over time, the innovators get better and better and better. They climb the ladder um, of the market. And by the time they get to the top, where the best customers with the most money are, they're so much better at what they're doing, the old firms can't compete and they're totally blown out of the water. Now, uh, can that, uh, I wonder if that model can even work in higher education because you know, in, in steel or in automobiles, you don't have to have the best consumers to have a success but in higher education if you want to prove that you're a success you have to draw the best students so how well, can only if we don't have other measures of success and I would argue that's a huge failure in the higher education market right now that we that we assume the colleges that recruit the best students are the best but I think it's a it's basically it's circular I mean everyone just wants to go to a place where everyone wants to go um, we don't really have any information about added value in higher education, and I've certainly met people who went to elite colleges who tell me they've learned very little while they were there. So um, how are we going to... Are we going to... Just on this one quick point, uh, I've, uh, I've heard that there's resistance from elite colleges to even permit longitudinal studies uh, tracking students over time, and I wonder if you think it might be productive for the federal government to step in and mandate that, you know, if you're going to receive these funds, you have to be part of some longitudinal study that is tracking outcomes over time. I mean, would you be open to things like that? And do you think that we actually have good 
uh, outcome measurements that might make such thing uh, productive? Uh, uh, to answer your two questions, definitely yes, and a qualified maybe. So uh, absolutely, I think that um, colleges and universities that participate in federal funding programs ought to be uh, subject to transparency about their outcomes. I don't think it's the proper role of the federal government to run the colleges, but I do think that you should require them to provide information about what they're doing, just like they do with you know publicly traded firms that want to participate in the capital markets. Um, and, there is intense resistance among not just elite colleges, but frankly, any colleges, to being subject to any kind of longitudinal study of how well they're teaching students where the results would be made public. There was a very high profile book that was written last year by uh, a couple of sociologists, Richard Aram and Hustle Barosa, called Academically Adrift, where they actually did that. They, they took a population of uh, students enrolling in four year colleges and universities, tracked them for four years, gave them a, a uh, the best available test of higher, uh, higher order of thinking and communication skills when they enrolled, gave it to them again when they graduated, calculated the differences, found some very disturbing results. A lot of students didn't change very much over four years. But the condition of that study was that none of the colleges have ever been identified. That is right. incredible. Yeah, I mean, not only have, the, have do we not know what the scores were for the colleges, we don't even know what colleges were in the study. And that's the condition that any higher education researcher has to agree to if they want to do anything that's interesting. Um, and here's the thing, that test that they used is being used by hundreds of colleges today. But they're not required to make it public because they can do what they want. That's amazing. Arnold, I'm sorry I interrupted oh. you earlier. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Uh, you have yeah, actually, Arnold, do you mind if I, because you asked a question about how disruptive innovation applies to college, and I think there's an answer, but I think, um, but I think it requires a distinction between the kind of services that colleges provide. When people apply the Christensen model to higher education, they usually talked about the inferior service I talked about being online education. The idea is, well, it's not as good as going to a traditional liberal arts college, but it might be pretty good and its scale is much, much, much cheaper. But I think the service the college is providing is the credential. I don't think they're providing, it's not the teaching, it's the credential. And, and so far, <laughs> the firms that are in the business of providing online education are still selling the same old credentials, bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees, and some workforce certificates. When you think about MITx, and they're offering brand new credentials that sit outside of that existing system, that's where I see the initially inferior product that will take root and get better and better and better over time. So an inferior badge of some sort. Exactly. You know, if, and, right now, a, a, a badge in graphic design is not as good as a bachelor's degree in graphic design, I suspect. But I think the one is going to get better a lot faster than the other. And, 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 and is there, there anyone else? An area where that's not true. I think that graphic design, because you can have a portfolio, is one domain where actually the prestige or, degree, but I take your point, yeah. almost any other domain where you don't have a clear test of the quality of the work that you're doing, I think that you're absolutely right. And are there any other people besides MITx that are in that business of coming up with better, with, with alternative well, so, badges? So there's another one, there was a, a very high profile kind of experiment run just this fall with a couple of adjunct professors at Stanford University where they took the artificial intelligence class that they were teaching to 175 students who had won the admissions tournament to get to Stanford and open it up to anyone in the world who wanted to take it online. Something like 100,000 people signed up, but the impressive thing was that tens of thousands actually started turning in homework assignments and taking exams in proctored sites around the world. And it turned out that quite a few of them did just as well on these exams as the, uh, the elite Stanford students. And so, you know, these are, the professors are people who also are very tied into the you know, kind of venture capital and Silicon Valley world. Just a few weeks ago, they announced that they were going to take this enterprise private and form a new for-profit company called Udacity that was going to do exactly what they did, um, but without sort of the, the implied Stanford imprimatur. Um, uh, so we'll see if that works. They'll be offering credentials based on just their own authority. I am an expert in artificial intelligence. I'm a famous person. I say that you've learned something. Um, and Kevin, in a way, Western Governors University, because of its competence
competency-based nature might also serve as a kind of platform for other instructional providers so that you go to Western Governors for the credential, but you perhaps go for the instruction to some other one of these providers that you talked about the federal government could charter? Yeah, in some ways, that's how Western Governors works now. They don't, they don't create their own curricular materials. They're not really in the teaching business. They get all of that stuff um, from other sources because they focus on high volume professions like health, education, business, and IT. And there are tons of educational programs and materials that can be uh, bought off the shelf or modified. They're not, they don't have any need to reinvent that wheel. So they're really actually in the business of defining competencies, assessing competencies, um, giving students guidance and support to work on a self-directed basis through educational materials that someone else created um, and then providing credits that work within our kind of larger system of credits and credentialing. So I would argue they're not, in a way, they're already doing that. Okay. Can we, uh, I was thinking as a wrap-up question, unless you have something else, Ryan, maybe something on sort of where does, what public policies could sort of promote, best promote this innovation and these alternative badges, if that's kind of the key? So I think that's uh, um, an interesting policy that's underway right now. Um, uh, there is a, as part of the uh, student loan reforms that were passed two years ago, there was a $2 billion program created to help uh, essentially community colleges serve displaced workers. And I, I didn't think it was actually going to be very interesting, but they made it a really interesting choice, which was to say, to the extent that you spend the money on um, creating new materials, online materials, you have, to be able, you have to make it available to anyone in the world under a Creative Commons license. So not only could people use it, but they could uh, improve it and resell it if they want to. I think that's a public policy where the government is um, investing in innovation in a way that doesn't presume that only public institutions ought to be in the business of, of providing these services. Uh, and I think, I think um, making our system of financing higher education more outcomes focused and neutral as to means and focused on ends uh, uh, as a guiding principle is, is is very important. Um, and again, kind of getting back to the, the, the question that Ryan asked at the very beginning, what we heard from the Obama administration last week was, I think, um, a new tone in the, the relationship between the entity of the public that is increasingly becoming the banker for higher education, the federal government, um, and traditional colleges and universities. I mean, I think that we're just going to be in a, a, an era of greater scrutiny, greater focus on outcomes. I personally think that the uh, the framework that was established for for-profit universities last year, where we we ask questions about um, how much money are your graduates making in the job market? Can they pay their loans back? That should be extended to nonprofit universities too. There are plenty of nonprofit universities that are that are uh, would not look very good uh, according to those measures. Thanks so much, Kevin. This is really fascinating, partly because it seems that what you're suggesting is that there might be a new political polarization so that debtors, students with heavy debt burdens, might perhaps be mobilized in the federal government against higher education incumbents who've tended to dominate the policies of higher education. So the least I've seen that happen. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, I mean, so far, there's a, a lot of the rhetoric I hear from, uh, and I actually wrote about this, uh, from the debtors is blaming the lenders. I don't think the lenders are really the, 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 the villains here. I think it's the people that, that charge the prices that made debt unavoidable. Um, I'm not sure people realize that. We yeah, just, no, I just think it will see how that plays out. All right, great. Thanks a lot, guys. I thought it was really Thanks good. Thanks so much. I enjoyed the conversation.